Hi. Can't stay? No worries. Thank you. I appreciate it, Jack. Have a great time at rehearsal. Emojis here, no worries. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same. All right. Well, let's 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 get started. All right. Today I'm talking. Oh, geez, I've just ruined it. So recently, Krita updated, and I haven't quite gotten used to the update. But that's okay. Today we are studying genetic variation. Genetic variation, that's right. What is genetic variation, you might ask? Genetic variation is very simply the different things in a gene, in, in, in the genes, that makes everything a little bit different. But we're talking about micro-genetic variation, particularly prokaryotes. So, microbe genetic variation. And happy you're here. I want to say hi. Oh, hi! Hi, happy and fate. Let me let me put that in chat since I don't think you can hear me. Hi, happy and fate. There we go. There we go. We've got to we've got to give some people some hugs. Not not everyone is is. Uh... Oh dear. What have I just done? There we go. Okay, and we're using prokaryote tonight as my VTuber because I'm the tired. The tired is upon me, but we're going to at least do an hour of studying, and honestly, streaming it is the only way to ensure that I actually do it. You know how it is. You know how it is. Anyways, generally speaking, there are two different ways that you can get genetic variation if you are a microbe. So two ways, and that is going to be through laternal or... Uh, vertical or horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal is this is from mother to daughter cell. Oh gosh, I don't have enough. My handwriting is so large; it's it's a problem all the time. It's always a problem too. Let's let's just make this small. To daughter cell. Wonderful. So vertical is uh, mother to daughter cell, and horizontal is cell from friend or environment. So, how do you get things out of the environment if you are a cell? Well, if you are a cell picking up things from the environment, then you are doing a transformation. Come on, there we go. Formation. How about from a friend? A friend is transduction, or I'm sorry, is conjugation. Conjugate. The gay. And how I remember that is it's got gay in it. It's from a friend, your conjugation. It's kind of like sex, but also it's not. So conjugation is when you are getting tra uh, stuff from a friend and, or foe. Honestly, you can get things from foes as well. And foe, that is transduction. So here we are. We are a cell. Up in cell world, the tiny of the cell worlds, because we is really small. We are a microbe. We want some more genetic variation. We've got two options, vertical or horizontal. Now, vertical is if we, the cells, going to become two cells, so you've got two daughter cells here, um, and mother cells going to split, 
and somehow a mutation happens, right? Mute or damage. It doesn't super matter. But vertical genetic variation happens all the time, but is also maybe a bad thing. So we're not going to be talking about vertical right now. Whoosh, not going to talk about vertical. Wow, that was such a bad squiggle. That was also a bad squiggle. Where, what is, what is happening to my squiggling powers? There we go. So we're not going to talk about vertical. We are going to talk about horizontal. Cell, you can, you, you, so this is you, this is me. We are the cell. We can get new genetic variation from friends, from foes, or from the environment. If we're getting it from the environment, it's transformation. If we're getting it from a friend, it's conjugation, because we're gay. And we're getting it from a friend. Uh, actually, we can get it from lots of friends, so, you know. Or foe, transduction, so that's a virus. <clears throat> Anyways, what we are going to talk about right now is conjugation. We're going to talk about this one, uh, because that is the one that I currently have my notebook opened up to. If you have requests and want to talk about transformation or transduction, tell me now. Otherwise, we're talking about conjugation. So, I'm going to keep all my notes, and it's just going to be in the order that I, I do them, because this is, this is studying. This is for me. This is not for you. I love you dearly, but also... Conju... Jeez, the tablet makes my handwriting horrible. Actually, my handwriting is just horrible. Anyway, conjugation. Pillis. Pillis. So, this is via a mating bridge. Actually, it's not actually called a mating bridge anymore. Old, crusty scientists way back when who didn't know what they were talking about called it a mating bridge. Sometimes they knew what they're talking about, but usually they didn't. It is safe to say most old scientists didn't know what they were talking about. They just saw things and were like, huh, I'm going to make a best guess. Nowadays, that's not the case. But anyways, they called it a mating bridge. We're not going to call it that because that's wrong. Um, and generally, when you are passing through the bridge, it is via, you're passing, um, 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 what, geez, I'm sorry. Uh, plasmids or chromosomes through here, and only if it's an HRF strain, but generally it's not, so we're not going to worry about it too much. So, retractable pillars that pull cells together. So, retractable pillars. Now, what is a pillars, you ask yourself? Um, a pillars is where you've got a little cell here. And they have, and they have, got another little cell here, and he says, Wow, I've got a plasmid in me that's super cool. This plasmid's super awesome. It gives me antibiotic resistance. And you know what you don't have? You don't have the plasmid here. I know that this thing is super helpful and super useful and is going to be super helpful and super useful in the near future. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to every one of my friends so that we all have antibiotic resistance. I'm going to make this little pilly. And the pillus, this is a pillus, is going to wiggle around enough until he finds another cell. Now, this cell has little receptors that says, I don't have whatever the recent new coolest antibiotic resistance is. And we're not entirely sure how the pillars find out that this guy doesn't have the antibiotic resistance. Because if there's another friend nearby and closer who also has it, this pillars will not bind to it. But it will bind to this friend and immediately hijack and pull him over. So now... We have little friend with antibiotic resistance and other little friend who's about to become antibiotic resistant, but isn't yet. And little friend who also has antibiotic resistance. Maybe this was friend one. Doesn't matter. Anyways, once you are pulled over, you are then going to do... Um, maybe I should have talked more about them. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, Multi-direction, try to catch other cells, blah, blah, blah. I just talked about that. Uh, I don't know what it is. So... You, this pillus is hollow on the inside, right? And this little antibiotic resistance is going to come over, migrate over to where our little mating bridge is. We're going to do a close-up drawing. So we've got, this is friend one, this is friend two, and this pillus between us is hollow on the inside. So we're going to erase this. Now, it is bad for this friend, plasmid, I'm going to put a P here, if he just gives his plasmid away. Also, that's not going to fit. How do you get this nice round plasmid in through a little hole? The answer is rolling circle replication. So this little friend is going to rolling circle replication. If you don't know what that is, uh, we're not going to talk about it right now. Uh, but it is a cool way that plasmids are replicated. So rolling circle, which is going to allow 
this guy to maintain his plasmid and keep it, but still give friend number two, this is friend number one, friend number two, uh, if we want to, to science words, this is donor, and this is recipient. Um, so, now recipient meet now has, here, let's, let's move this down, recipient now has and is gaining a very nice, useful, straight piece of DNA, which they don't actually want to be straight. We want this to be a useful, nice plasmid that we can get antibiotic resistance off of. What does he do? Well, he's got to circulize this plasmid. There are some nice proteins that immediately bind up on here, actually the moment that it enters, and that's going to protect it. DNA is super fragile. It kind of just wants to fall apart. All actually, it's not. RNA is super fragile. DNA is semi-fragile. How, how do... On a scale of 1 to 10, DNA is like an 8. On stability, and RNA is like a 3. So I guess it has, it's, anyways, it's super important. So let's talk about important. And so you don't want horrible things to happen to it. So you are going to put all these nice little binding proteins. It's going to protect it and immediately start packaging it. Specifically this end, because that end is going to be able to link up to the other end once it is fully sent through the pillus. Granted, these um, do have to be specific kind of uh, plasmids to be capable of doing this in the first place. It needs to have an ORI team. So, here, let's, let's put Ori. T. This is the origin of transduction. Because it's used for transferring genes. And also, this needs to be a type 4 secretion system. Type 4. Type 4. Um, but generally speaking, like I said, this doesn't super matter for you. But it matters for me. And this stream is for me to study. And that's what we're doing. Anyways. If you have any questions, drop it in chat. If you don't, I'm going to charge right on. Maybe I'll skip ahead because I'm feeling okay about transduction, but I probably don't feel okay. Or, poof, I'm sorry, this is conjugation. We're going to talk about relaxosomes. Relaxosomes are fun. So, anyways, let's. So, so you have this this nice little pillus that has just pulled everything over, and this is going to be by a tram A and trans A disassemble. This one needs to. Anyways. Trans D. Do I need to know all of these? I feel like I probably do. I'm going to skip ahead though. Anyways, you are going to bind all of your brand new, very important DNA that has your antibiotic resistance on it. You're going to find the other end. Usually this is going to be bound and held somewhere so it isn't going to be lost. And then it will be re-ligated to make a new circle. In which case, then look, all of us now have, now we are three little friends who all have antibiotic resistance and continue about our lives. And you know what? At this point, we could go back to our previous gene and vertical. Now that we all have antibiotic resistance, you know what we can do? We can make more of us who also have antibiotic resistance. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, well, that's nice. That's conjugation in a nutshell. We're going to skip ahead, though, because I don't really want to talk about the relaxosome. I guess we could. Uh, do you want to hear about the relaxosome? I don't want to talk about the relaxosome. Transfer to a hole. So the relaxosome is basically how the rolling circle is started. So like I said, this is not the normal place that this plasmid is going to be replicated. In fact, a plasmid that is capable of being transferred through these sorts of situations have all sorts of fun things on them, including ORET. So Ori T, this is just the origin of which we're going to be doing these sorts of things. Um, relaxosome is going to do two things. One, it is going to bind here on Ori T and it's going to shuttle Ori T all the way over to wherever our pillus is formed. Usually most cells have a pretty stringent set of rules on where they're going to form the pillus, but for now we're just going to say we take it to the pillus. And that is step one is confirm that there actually is a junction that has been made and they are going to melt a site in the DNA. So we have a DNA here, right? This you can't actually get into because we have all these nice little base pairs happening. So what these relaxosomes are going to do is put a lot of little, little pressure, little heat, and they are going to turn this into a bubble. And this is going to allow a replication, or a re replosome to be able to get in here. And the replosome is going to come in, so rep, replosome, and that is going to then 
insert, I'm sorry, do we nix something, don't we? Yes, we do. Number two, once we have our replizome loaded, the relaxosome is going to come in with a pair of scissors and cut this. Ah, now we're cut. However, this gives us a free end, which will then be inserted into our little, um, our bridge. Right? And then we can continue on with rolling circles. So now that we have been cut, we have been inserted, and now we are going to make sure that the new cell has one of the old original strands from friend one, who is our donor, and one brand new strand for, for the recipient, who will make kind of themselves, but kind of not. Kind of it's the plasm itself making it. Um, so they have a set of ways that they control the relaxosome. Uh, we're not going to talk about it. I always said I wasn't going to talk about the relaxosome, and we talked about the relaxosome. Hi, Apollo. Yeah, we're going to be talking about microbial genetics. Do you want to hear about microbial genetics, Apollo? Anyways, this is the relaxosome. And it puts things, I, I don't know if, how, I don't know when you got here or how much of that you understood. But I don't want to keep talking about the relaxosome because it does two jobs, okay? It does two jobs. One is localization. So it localizes the plasmid and ORET to the place where it's going to be moving between two cells. And then two is cut. Cut and load. Cut, load. So we are cutting uh, the DNA, shoving it through the hole, and we are loading the replosome, which will actually do the replication. Okay, yeah. If this doesn't make sense, I'm sorry. But I'm not entirely sure how to make it make sense. That's why I'm studying it. <laughs> Anyways, let's skip ahead. Let's skip ahead. Let's not talk about conjugation. Let's talk about... Here, you tell me. Do you want to talk about transformation or trans... I'm um, sorry. Transformation or transduction. One of them is involves viruses. Actually, we'll do them at the same time. So transform and transduction. Transduction. Wow, my handwriting is just going to get worse and worse. That's fine. So in both of these, it differs in what is being set into the system and what is going to come out of the system. So donor versus recipient. What is the recipient getting and what does it become? So in transformation, which is this one, your chromosome genes are still chromosome genes. It never changes. So chromo to chromo. Chromo to chromo. Transduction is chromosome to plasmid or chrom uh, chromo. So chromo to plasmid. Or maybe to a chromosome. That also happens. But probably not. This is this is less likely, so we'll just put a wiggly next to it. So say maybe, but maybe not. That's okay. Whatever happens, it's fine. So the major difference is transformation is stuff that is happening from the environment. This is short. Usually it's linear. And we are sipping this up from environment. Environment. And this is generally going to be uh, DNA or RNA. Doesn't uh, DNA or RNA doesn't actually just have to be. This has to be DNA. This is DNA. DNA, DNA or RNA. And additionally, this is from phage. Phage are viruses that infect bacteria. So phage. Phage, which is a virus. Let me not write phage twice. Virus. So um, think your your little trapezoid dudes who look like spiders, right? Wow, this is the worst phage. We're, we're just we'll just write an M. Yeah, fine. Um, so phage, and this is environment. So I'll write a little sun. Cool. Environment phage. So this, where does this come from? Probably from a lot of death. Uh, whether that be death of other cells, whether that be um, something that another cell kicked out. So death or rejection, uh, things like that. There's just a lot of free DNA out in the world, and sometimes bacteria are capable of slurping it up. Not all bacteria are capable of this, it should be clear. And not all phage do this. So there is a, a asterisk in both of these situations. But where, where is this coming? Like, why is a phage 
running around with cell DNA in it. Well, phage and viruses, you generally have to think of them as little robots. Okay, they don't make decisions, they just do things. And so we are little robots. And sometimes we are little robots, we mess up. And then we're sad little robots, but we don't even know that because we're robots. So when you are a phage and you have just spent a great deal of time inside of this poor unsuspecting bacteria, you filled it up and you've hijacked all of its little processes and now it's full of phage, it is made for you. The thing is, this is kind of done very quickly, and there are errors. So this bacteria had its own plasmid and its own DNA that usually, in the process of infection, is damaged in some way. Here, let me let me do this in a different color. It's usually going to be damaged in some way. And when it's damaged, sometimes that is packaged into the little phages. So we've got our, our phage. I'm just going to keep doing a diamond, even though it's not a diamond, but we're, we're, it doesn't super matter what shape it is. So this, usually, this is a viral capsid. The head capsid is where viral DNA hangs out. But sometimes, this is going to be host DNA. And we're going to switch up our colors. So host DNA was accidentally captured in here, but the virus doesn't know that, right? You're a robot. You don't notice these things. I just know that I am a complete robot. My job is to insert... When I run into a new cell, I insert this into that. That is all that I do, because I am a robot, and I am not smart. So, robot does that, not knowing that this, in fact, was not its own DNA. It will not result in an infection, and will not result in any uh, meaningful propagation of nice little virus robots. It will result in the new cell. This is cell. This is cell. We just had our, our nice little virus robot hang out and inject the wrong thing into it now has this weird new DNA in it. It's like, oh, well, that's strange. What do I do with it? I already have my own DNA. What do I do with all this extra DNA? It doesn't seem to be hurting me. Well, sometimes this is going to become, uh, if there was another virus, then nothing happens. I infect, I die, I become like my brethren over here. But sometimes this can be integrated into my own DNA. That is where it becomes chromosome sometimes again you have to have specific se um, sequences or you have to have been infected by a prophage so prophage can do this part so pro phage if we are a prophage then we end up inside of our friend um, and we just kind of hit a ride for a while now the thing is there's a huge decision in becoming a prophage versus a lytic phage so this one that exploded i guess i didn't tell you guys guys i'm sorry he exploded. He exploded full of virus, and now there's there's virus everywhere. And no! Ah, ah. Anyways, so, if we're integrating, there's a huge difference between becoming lytic and becoming a prophage. And this decision for the virus isn't really made by the virus. It is made by a combination of environmental factors, so, like, how happy the cell is, how much ATP is available, and how well the cell's immune system is going. So if you didn't know, bacteria have immune systems. Everything has, that's not true. Bacteria have immune systems. Like CRISPR, if you're familiar with CRISPR, here is, uh, er, that's not a misspelling, that's actually what it is. This is commonly something interspaced repeats. Hmm, something spaced repeats. Anyways. These guys, CRISPR, that is a bacterial immune system. We now use it for editing genes because it's very useful. But originally, we discovered it as part of a bacterial immune system. Nice. Cool. Uh, do we want to talk about transformation or transduction? I kind of feel like we're, we're on a good transduction vibe right now. Let's talk about the decision on whether or not to become an lytic or a prophage. Again, all of this is over the... What am I talking about today? Variation. Right? I, that is what I'm talking about right now. Yeah. Microbial variation. Well, whether or not we become a lytic phage or a, a lysogenic phage... I'm sorry. Whether an infection becomes lytic or lysogenic has a lot to do with variation. Because clearly, if we are killing our, our host, we are not increasing genetic variation. That does not increase genetic variation at all. But becoming a prophage does. That means that now our new host has lots of new genes that it 
doesn't necessarily have a use for, but sometimes it does if I accidentally put the genes of my friends into me, which does happen. So remember, uh, law of large numbers, this is a lot of large numbers happening over here. But let's talk about transduction, lytic versus lysogenic. Whoops, this was on the wrong. Okay. Lytic. Cool. Lytic versus lysogenic. Lysogenic is prophage. And lytic is just phage, so propagation, which will become, let's just say, cell death. Uh, host death. Okay. There we go. So lytic is host death for the cell. And remember, this is a bacteria that then goes pop. And he is now popped. And prophage is where I'm a bacteria with a genome. And now I've become a bacteria with a genome that is not entirely my own. I have a little bit of lies within my genome. And you know what? We're going to be okay with these lies. These lies are going to be a-okay for now. Um, all right, so... The main difference, like I said, is going to be whether or not we are being hijacked, or when we are being hijacked, what is going to be made. And there are a couple decisions, wow, there are a couple factors that are going to be guiding this. There are temperature gradients that you can do, a couple studies you can do with mutants to encourage lytic versus lysogenic. But the bottom line is that, where are my notes on this? I'm sorry, I'm looking for notes currently. Uh, so, first off, in an infection, so let's talk infection, there is kind of a clock that's going on. And in this clock, you have early, middle, I'm just going to put middle and late. And what is happening when I say early, middle, and late? That is what genes on the virus. Let me draw a little virus here. What genes on the virus are being expressed? Okay, in the early, middle, and late. It is not advantageous for the virus to be making, say, capsid proteins super early on, right? Because we need to control the host. So early on, they're making all of the proteins and all of the ways that they are then going to be using to hijack our host to become a little virus factory. Let me put in the virus factory. So, in becoming a little virus factory, in the early stage, that is all we care about is hijacking things. In the middle stage, we care about maintenance and getting all of the resources. And late phage is actually putting our end virus together. So that is when we are doing the assembly line. So late is assembly. Uh, early is hijack. And middle is usually resources. And making parts. So resource and production, let's say. In doing resource and production, what we're doing is... is well, here, let's just, just, just say some things that we are going to be making first up. If we are, in fact, a T4, so let's talk specifically about T4. So T4 is a specific kind of virus, which I'm not going to talk about details right now, because it doesn't matter. T4 virus, this particular kind of virus, and this is not all viruses, this is T4, and sometimes T4-like viruses, but sometimes T4-like viruses also lie. There are just many lies in how vir virus viruses are a pain. No one, no one likes viruses. Everyone likes viruses. I'm sorry. I'm not. I shouldn't be mean to viruses. But anyway, so there's going to be a lot of nucleoid uh, persecutors. There's going to be a lot of host interference. And it's trying to control that between. And some of the control ways that a virus has is by making two proteins called ASI-A and MOT-A. MOT-A and ASI-A are doing some cool stuff. It is modulating the RNA polymerase 
to not recognize things that the cell wants to do. So this is equals sad RNA polymerase. And general reminder, RNA polymerase. So this is a polymerase that is making RNA. So, you know, and a polymerase is one of the nice little proteins that grabs onto things and reads them and turns it into other things, whether that be more RNA or proteins or DNA. Polymerase is cool. He's, he's uh, a doer. So da sad RNA polymerase can only, cannot recognize, can't um, recognize minus 35. Minus 35 is the location on the genome that RNA polymerase needs in order to bind. And they do this by tilting it up. So it tilts up. We're now we'll just simplify to conformational change. Conf, conf change. Cool. Conf change is what stops that. And now it is only binding to minus 30. Or I'm sorry, now it's binding to minus 30 equals minus 30 equals virus starts. So basically the viral promoters, instead of having a minus 30, uh, minus 10, I'm sorry, minus 35, minus 10, like the cell does, this is a host start, host, this, uh, the virus is minus 30. So the virus makes these two enzymes that are going to capture RNA polymerase and yell at it and make it change its form so that it now it can only recognize virus start sites instead of uh, host cell start sites. Now clearly this is a bit of a problem because now there will be very little um, host cells uh, things happening. So now the host is sad because now host cells are not being replicated because it's just lost one of its some of its polymerase, not just one. It'll be lots. This is happening all over. So it's a big deal. So now we have a sad host, but the sad host has noticed this and is going to start having some problems. And it is it is going to say, no, I'm going to fight back. So what the cell does in the middle, we're doing resource gathering at this point, um, and we're going to start preparing to kill the cell in the middle phase. And so we're going to make a bunch of pores. So that we can, one, we're using up resources and we're some kind of encouraging the cell to do it at once, but also not. It's a very toxic relationship between this virus and this cell, but we're going to make porins, which, uh, hollins, which are preparing for cell lysis. This is going to be upping the um, by a hollin. Holland raft. So Holland rafts are normally what is going to be on a cell membrane making little pores so that things can get in. But if you up the number of Hollands, so adding more and more Hollands, then this pore gets bigger and bigger and all of a sudden the membrane is destabilized and it explodes and it lets out all the viruses that we're making in the assembly line, right? Remember? This is where Holland have reached critical so this is hall in critical and cell death. So host death. Sad, sad host. Um, and what else are we doing in this phase? G5 accumulates. I know a bunch of things accumulate. So lots of, uh, again, assembly lines, a lot of stuff accumulates and it's starting to make full little viruses. Whoa. For the virus, you know. I guess it, it depends on if you're team virus or team host. It, it doesn't super happen right now. But again, this is in T4 viruses where they're vaguely this is how other things happen, but not necessarily. So, moving right along. In T4s, you have your early SIA and lot A, right? We already talked about them. And that is going to be making uh, a viral sigma factor. So, S I how do I spell that? S I A Mot A Viral Sigma Factor. Viral Sigma Factor 55 specifically. This is like a oh, it's a signal factor. But I feel like it says what it is. Signal. Um and signal factors can basically be said it's a little flag. 
we, in our little flagness of power of being a signal factor, we are controlling things. It is going to direct the host. So this is what is actually directing host. Um, host polymerase, who is still sad because he's being directed around. Um, early on, it can still do minus 35. And then once signal 55 is on, now we are becoming minus 30, which is a different set of viral genes, right? We already talked about that. And then in the very late stage, so early, middle, late, late, we can only do minus 10. So I would say it is safe to say that minus, that maybe I've been a little bit hasty with how I'm labeling my polymerase here. It is possible that polymerase is just not super cool about things, unhappy about things, absolutely devastated about everything, and things are really bad by this point. But that makes sense. There's no way to, for the immune system to fight back at this point. So it's not going to. Um, and now it is only doing late genes. And this is part of how the virus ensures that we are getting different genes made, different proteins made at different points in the infection cycle. Um, apparently this has something to do with sliding lamps and activators, but we're not gonna talk about sliding lamps or activators instead. <sighs> oh, I talk about virus assembly either. I apologize for the on. I am a bit tired. But I said I was going to study for an hour, bare minimum. If we can do more than that, that'd be awesome. But bare minimum, we're going to get through at least to this section. Lysogenic. Let's talk about lysogenic. Before I talk about the decision to become lysogenic versus lytic, you need to understand what lysogenic is. So lysogenic. And remember, this is the one that actually increases genetic variation. We need to keep reminding ourselves that what we actually care about through all of this is genetic variation. This actually increases, so genetic variation. Because sometimes host DNA is injected and follows into the next cycle and allows homologous recombination. Host DNA homologous but this is super rare doesn't happen often so eh, it happens but not super often more often is the um, going to be that a dead cell then with lysic a lysic um, will release more host DNA which will then be slurped up through transformation but we talked about that earlier so more likely is this becomes a prophage, which is viral DNA. In host. Not all viruses are capable of becoming prophages, but all prophages are viruses, if that makes sense. Um, circle within circle, if you want to think about it that way. But this is... Um, going to be a site-specific recombination rather than homologous recombination. So site-specific. This is the larger cause of genetic variation. I'm just going to put GV for now. And because again, that's what we care about. So larger cause of genetic variation is your nice little prophages here. And Let's see. Package. Packaging, prophage, and grade, blah, blah, blah. Stuck on DNA. I just said all of that. Whoops, not what I wanted. Give me a second. Ah. Uh, hmm. How do I do this? I'm not actually sure. Okay. So sometimes you can get lysogenic phages inside of lytic phages. Uh, which is cool, but we're not, again, we're not going to talk about that right now because we are focusing on the happiness of genetic variation. So, lambda, here, so before this, we were talking about T4, right? Oh, wait, hang on. Here, we're talking about T4. Over here, we're talking about lambda. So let me get another color for lambda. There we go. Lambda is going to be 
and this is the symbol for lambda. So the phage we're talking about now is lambda. Generally, this is going to be a, um, well, not generally, it is. Lambda, again, is a, only a kind of virus. It is not necessarily all lysogenic viruses, but this is the most studied lysogenic virus, therefore the one that they teach because they know the most about it. We are going to be, instead of a squat little guy, we are instead going to be a cool cetiophore. So we have a nice bendy tail. Bendy. Wow. Uh, we are, our receptors are LPS and the Lambda B, long and flexible. They use water flood ejecting. And again, these are not things that I have given you any context for. So I'm sorry if it doesn't make sense. Anyways, they become, have a decision to become lytic or lysogenic. So, lytic or lyso. And this decision is the environmental versus host immune decision. Um, lytic will be just like T4. So we blow our cell up at the end. And lysogenic is we become a prophage. We are generally in this discussion, even though the insertion of host DNA by homologous recombination is possible. Again, less common. And right now we're just going to talk about prophages in general because it is easier to talk about that one first. And this is going to be based on a set of lysogenic versus lytic signals. So I'm going to stay in blue because we're still talking about lambda. Lyso signal versus Lytic signal. So the lytic signal is going to be a protein called CRO. CRO concentration versus CL concentration. C, actually, I'm sorry, it's C1. C1. So concentration of CRO versus CL1 is really the bottom line of the lysogenic versus lytic decision. And that is because this is the activator. of lysogenic genes and for C1 this is an activator for an integrase. Uh, integrase is the thing that is actually going to take the piece of viral DNA and insert it into host genome. So the thing that actually makes it do this, do that say integration, is the integrase. Boop. That's what we do here. And that's very nice. And the host factors are going to dictate the tug of war. Host factors are going to stop. So here, let's let's go back to black for host factors. Host factors are going to inhibit crow host. Um, but crow is going to inhibit lysogenic. And again, it's concentration that is going to be making this decision. Um, when there is lots of when there is C1, integrase gets made and it increases the chances of the cell living and just taking on the hitchhiker of the virus. When there's not, then it's not. But uh, it should be noted both of these are activators and repressors. It's just that specifically Crow is an activator for Linux, so don't let that confuse you. Um, oh no. Computer. There we go. Please, computer, please. I'm trying to talk about science. There we go. It's going to be fine now. So, how do you wake up and remove a repressor? We're going to talk about later um, because there are some other proteins that are involved in that N protein. And that is, but right now we're going to keep talking about uh, CRO1 and CRO2. I'm sorry, I keep, it's CRO, C1, C2, and C3. So C1, C2, and C3. C2 plus C3. C3 is a protector. Protect C2, and C2 activates C1. You only need a teeny tiny amount of C2 to exist for things to go lysogenic. So this is the 1% rule. So if there is 1% C2 being made, then you can go into C1 and make your integrases. So 
the whole reason that he is so important is he is a sacrifice protector. Sacrifice. C3 looks a lot like C2. So when the host, I'm sorry, when the lytic phage is making things to degrade C2, instead, uh, it's called FIS8, FIS4, FS, FITS. Who is this? The thing that degrades C2 is a host immune response. FITS H. ATP. So, ATP. Now I should do this in black because it's the host. There we go. So, FTSH, FITS H, degrades C2. So, we are stopping C2. But what this guy can do is sacrifice himself instead of C2. C3 says, uh uh. We need to at least get to that 1% so that we can stay within our lives and keep hanging out in this nice cell. But this only happens, because again, this is host environment, is if there is lots of ATP. This requires energy in order to degrade C2. So if there's lots of degrading going on, then the virus starts making C3, which will then sacrifice itself, and then you have lots of degrading of C3 and C2. But hopefully, the thought is, more C3, so that C2 concentration is able to go up. If that was the case, that's very nice, because men, we've got some repressors here, and this C1, whoops, 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 come on computer, C1 is a repressor to Pro1. Actually, it's not. It's a repressor to PR and PR1. PI? Presses P, come on, P R and P I, which are what allows Crow to do job. Okay, so Crow um, activates its own synthesis. Actually, C1 also activates its own synthesis. Once it's made, basically you're going to go lysogenic. But until it's made is really where the fight is happening, and that is this fight. Once this fight wins, then you can make C1. C1 is going to continue making more of itself, which then inhibits both of these activators, which then stop Crow from doing anything. Crow is also self-regulating, so I should say that as well. So we can self-regulate, and it's going to saturate promoters and eventually will block its own thing. So again, that's part of the self-regulation. But all of the fight is happening. Okay. Not all of the fight. A lot of the fight is happening right here. C1 versus C3. Which is pretty cool, but also a bit of a pain for this. What does Crow do? I need to talk more about Crow. Uh, that is the switch for controlling the circle Q buildup. What on earth does that mean? In the late phase. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, so this is... Do you remember we were talking about phases earlier? Phases. Pew, pew, pew. Come on. Nope. Where was I talking about phases? Wow. I've got... I, I, we did talk about phases, right? There's this stuff all in... Oh, this is it. That was it. Okay, so these phases... Crow is something that actually triggers the last step of late phase assembly. So, in Q... Q is something that happens in late phase, and lit, uh, Crow allows Q to do that. I don't know if it's an activator. I should find out how Crow does that. But anyways, it's related to Q. Whoops, let me be on the right layer and the right color. So Crow is a Q late phase. Friend. Um, and has something to do with Rec A. A. Which we will come back to. Or maybe we won't, honestly. We might not come back to it. But, anyways, Rec A is what we are going to be concerned about later in the future. Future us is going to worry about Rec A. Current us is not. Induction of the Crow phase. So, once we have actually done this, once we have managed to get lots of C1, so we're going to assume that we've gone lysogenic. Lyso 1. Yay! Lots of C1. C1 is self-regulating, and it's things are going great. But now, how do we actually integrate ourselves, this is ourselves, into host DNA, which is a full plasmid, or not a full plasmid, but it is a full circle. They have circle DNA. If you didn't know that, bacteria, 
circle DNA. Cool. How do we actually do that? The answer is DNA damage. <laughs> Basically, what an integrase is going to do is come with a pair of scissors and chop this up. And now that we have damaged this, DNA damage repair systems like Rec-A show up and say, Oh no, we're damaged! We're going to put little protectors here because now we're single-stranded, and that's not a good thing to do. Um, this cleaves the C1 repressor and is, is degraded and something... And your integrase now, remember we talked about integrase in, this is a viral integrase, it should be blue. Integrase is then going to go and insert the stuff in there. And later, exigase, ex, X-I-S, ex, X-E-R-A-S, how do you say that? Hmm, I don't know. Anyways, we'll then take it out later. And usually that is also going to be DNA damage that is telling it to go in as well. So buildup of Rec A in the future is what is going to trigger XAs to say, uh-oh, things are bad, we better leave and become a virus again. And now we go lytic. DNA bad, save ourselves, jump ship. It's not entirely clear how this signal is sent, but they think it has something to do with the SOS genes and Rec A being activated in high enough concentration. Because remember, there's always some Rec A, there's always some of these guys floating around. That's why something as low as 1% in the C2 is kind of crazy to think about. So just, what? This is happening? It's fine. <laughs> Anyways, Rec A is going to be doing cool things like, like that. And, and, and when Rec A is activated and saying, oh, we're going to save this DNA so that we can then repair it, Sometimes the viral exigenase is going to run away. But before it ran away, remember what we care about is genetic variation. That's what this stream is about. That's what I've been studying recently is genetic variation. Genetic variation in general, while that prophage is there, it has changed the genes that are then going to be transferred from daughter to, to, to mother to daughter. And because the mother cell doesn't know that this is here, we've accidentally just added more of our genome whoops, they're going to keep splitting, and that means that all future daughter cells, unless something goes wrong, are also going to have this genome. And these viruses are just going to ha keep hanging out. Some cool fun facts just about these, about viruses in general, and specifically prophage, is it's thought that part of the reason why humans have so much junk DNA because our genomes are super long and we don't actually use all of them. The thought is that those are ancient prophages and transposons and things like that. Those junk DNA isn't actually us. It is man, scars in history, genetic scars of previous infections, basically. Granted, transposons are kind of thought about as an infection as well, but they're kind of not, but they kind of are. Jumping genes, if you're familiar with jumping genes, that's a transposon. Transposons, they're just kind of... Exactly that, they jump around a genome. And they can jump out of the genome and, and make themselves into tiny plasmids sometimes. Anyways, how do you actually excise yourself? So, we are lysogenic, there has been something that has upset us, we are now uh, having lots of Rec A. How do we actually remove ourselves? Well, there are these things with call over here. It's an excision element. There are these things called inverted repeats. I R for short. Inverted repeats, and then we have our trans B N and another inverted repeat. These two inverted repeats tell the virus, well, this is where the end is, and that's where we, uh, well, these are transposons. We're talking about transposons now, by the way. I'm sorry, we've transitioned. Transposon. Okay, anyways, transposons have these nice little inverted repeats, and these are, you've got two options. You've got cut and paste. Cut, paste. And you have copy and paste. They are exactly like they sound like. Do not overthink them. Cut and paste. You remove it. You move it around. Copy paste. You copy it. Put it somewhere else. And 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 that's just how it's going to be. Anyways, 
You have non-composite transposons, which look exactly like this, and you have composite transposons. We're going to go back to being this one. Where you have a T on P. You've got another inverted repeat. You've got other genes. Other, and you've got another set of inverted repeats with another T and P. Now, with this one being a composite, so composite, composite, this one is going to be cut out as the whole thing, taking all of these other genes with us when we either cut and paste or copy and paste. So, the whole thing is going either moving or just being inserted again somewhere else as a nice little copy replica of ourselves. Here, very small. They're going to be jumping around still, but you're not having as huge of an influence on genetic variation as you might have originally. Anyways, there are multiple method mechanics to this and, and ways that this is going to be doing, um, but honestly, I'm very close to an hour here, so I'm instead going to save this. Where is this? This can go into pictures. Um, what am I doing with my life? Can you guys see this? I don't think you can. Uh, let's just put this in pictures and save it as study stream 2. Look at that. Saved as study stream 2. Look at that save. It's not saved. There it is. There it is. It's saved now. So, we've got study stream 2, we got to 10 layers this time, and I think that was slightly more streamlined than last time. Last time was kind of a mess, if I'm going to be honest. But I've done a solid hour of studying and teaching you about microbial genetics. If you understood any of this, awesome, congratulations. If you didn't, I'm sorry, but please know that it is helpful for me for random people to watch my streams, and helpful for me to study things because that's how that works. Uh, studying is helpful. You, you, you know that. I know that. Anyways, thank you for coming. Um, I'm, I'm going to call that good for now. I will probably do another study stream early next week. Or maybe mid next week. Or honestly, maybe this weekend. I don't know. I've got another big exam coming up, and I, I want things to be good. So anyways, thank you. What I really want to do right now is draw... I want to do the drawing, but I, I can't. I, I have to do the studying. But geez, um, I'm just itching to draw. But here I am studying instead. I guess that's a good thing to do. Look at me, I did a good thing today. And now I'm drawing. Well, that we're going to call it a night there. <laughs> Thank you for stopping in. Or, 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 you know, if you've gotten this far, congratulations. I, I, I don't know why you're here. Unless you just want to hear me rambling about things. Okay. We're just, we're just gonna stop now. Goodbye. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you for hanging out. I, I don't know. Just tired. But have a good one. Goodbye.